so you can eat. Yeah, I can cookies, eat. Cookies. Mahesh can't eat, yeah. I can drink cookies and cream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Lara, yeah. your daughter is growing up. How do you kind of ensure that she maintains a healthy diet and is not kind of gorging on junk food, chocolates, and colas? You know, the minute you have your kids, everybody becomes an encyclopedia on your child. So everybody wants to advise you. I mean, everyone, your mom, your mom-in-law, your sisters, your sister-in-laws, like the world, your friends. Um, so obviously, it was try and test to see because your child is not going to do things like other kids did it. So for us, from a very young age, especially from the time that she started solids, um, you know, the whole thing was don't start with something sweet. So actually, my poor child, the first thing that she ever had was an avocado. <laughs> but on the other hand, it helped her develop a really good, healthy relationship with vegetables. And so today, I have to be genuinely and say, honestly, I don't have a problem with cider. She's a good eater. I think that's my greatest blessing as a mom. Um, and yeah, it's trying to find that balance where you don't deny a child treats, but you just try and find smart ways of uh, sneaking in some healthy things while you're giving them a treat. Wow. You know what? I think you should write a book on this. Oh, yeah. Lara, <laughs> that should be your next book. <laughs> Really, I mean, your daughter has trained you so well. Yes, yeah, she has. <laughs> Mahesh, you know what? I think I would add a point here. She's really very nicely put it. So children develop taste buds anywhere from six months onwards till in the, in the first year of life. And if you introduce the correct kind of foods and if you introduce vegetables uh, and all the fruits that you want to and the cereals that you want to introduce and if it preferably being home-cooked food, at one year, your child is all set and you're not going to have any problem. It's like forming a blueprint on the baby's brain that what is correct to eat. So I think- What uh, we call it Lara as eating from well. the Wonderful. family pot. You know, so they eat what everybody else eats at home. Yeah, I see that happening with my daughter as well. What about she wants that only thing? Appa, eat, I want, I want, that's what. Yeah, you, you become a role model, right? So they want to eat what you are eating. Correct. And if they see you eating that as snacks, they will eat the same thing. Yeah. Wow, you know what? You're getting a lot of brownie points from the doctors as well. I know. Yeah? I feel so good. I feel validated because a lot of times mothers only feel guilt. So now when I hear that I'm doing something right, <laughs> it feels great. How many mothers over here feel <laughs> guilty at times? Put your hands up. I feel up. guilty all the time. Put, yeah. So <laughs> many of you all. Wow. So are you feeling validated right now? <laughs> Superb. Thank you to our doctors as well. Yes. You know, Mahesh, you know, they say child's health and diet is predominantly a mother's domain. Now, how do you ensure you remain hands-on and involved in your daughter's growing up with really good food habits? No, I think like, uh, you know, just said, I think we try to set an example uh, ourselves. I think, you know, Saira, we... Uh, make it a point to keep her life uh, very active. You know, she plays tennis, she goes swimming, she does dance. So we have to make sure that uh, it's very nutritional, her diet, and, uh, you know, keep the fruits and veggies coming. When Lara and me want to binge, we make sure the binge is after 8.30 when she goes to bed. <laughs> so she's not... Uh, so she's you know, not witness to it. <laughs> not watching us eat chocolates or pizza or ordering McDonald's or whatever it is. So, yeah, we, we have to make an effort ourselves. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So also, one important question out of curiosity. Um, so when she plays tennis, does she beat you 6-love, six 6-1, one, six 6-2, two, six <laughs> How is it? What's the sword that she beats you? Not yet. Hopefully in 10 years. <laughs> I am sure it's but she's already competing. She's 6 years old. She plays tennis almost 5 times a week. And uh, she's developing, starting to develop muscles on her arms. So every day, mom is being told, mama feel, mama feel. So then mama has to feel. And the next question is, when am I going to beat daddy? I was like, oh my God, I hope that never happens. <laughs> my daughter gets bigger than my husband. That would be a disaster. Mahesh, I think you're getting very insecure. I can see it. He knows in his head he's going to get beaten up very soon. Are you, are you feeling insecure about that? I'm used to it. <laughs> With all the ladies beating you, huh? All right. Uh, doctor. Mango. I mean, I live mangoes. I breathe mangoes. Summer season is for mangoes. In fact, I sometimes feel like a mango. I eat that so much, Lara, you know? You know? But what happens if your child does not love that fruit, which is the fruit of the season? So, uh, what do you do then? See, when you, when you look at from the child's angle, the first thing that the child would like to see in a food is taste. When you look at the particular food from a mom's or a nutritionist angle, I would look whether 
the food has got every nutrient that is required for the growth. So what predominates the child's choice of food is the taste. Children do not, they are not grown, they're they not born with varied taste and it's on us parents to introduce them to, to a variety of taste. Now mango per se is not the fruit that has got all the goodness. So I would say is introduce every fruit in a different way. So if, if the child wants to eat every other fruit, it's fine if, she, if the child doesn't want to eat just mangoes. Because uh, what you can do is you can hide, hide it in different uh, you know, ways and feed it to the child. The reason being is that uh, to develop a taste for the flavor and for the texture. So it may not only be mango, it could be various other flavors and textures which you are asking your child to learn and develop it so that they, the child does not grow with not knowing a particular texture, flavor, smell and all the feelings because development and growth is not only of you know height and weight but it's also your sensory development and that is the most important aspect when looking at a particular fruit may not be only mango. Ma'am, I have a very important question. There's a fight that I, my daughter and me have. If there are only two pieces of mango left on the plate, and I want both of them and she wants both of them, who should take them? The daughter. <laughs> Even my wife is here. She supports her, yaar. Lara, you support me. Should I have those two? Not at all. You don't look also. You could do without having two more slices of mango. Siddharth. <laughs> don't do this, yaar. This is going to go in a few <laughs> seconds. Don't worry, yaar. Thank you for supporting my daughter. And... I really Siddharth, adore. So that there is, uh, if I would throw this question to the audience. So as she very rightly said that children do not have all tastes and uh, they have, you have to nurture them and develop them. Can you make a wild guess that how many attempts you may require for a child? Say for instance, your child did not like mango. So how many attempts that you may require so that the child starts loving a mango? Make a wild guess. One. <laughs> if it would be so simple. <laughs> Yeah. Who said seven? seven? Put your hands up. Seven attempts. Okay. So statistics say for babies or children to develop a new taste, it may take anywhere from eight to 25 attempts. Wow. So if your child says, no, I don't like mango, so leave it at that time. Don't get stressed about it. Maybe a week later, try it again. Try it again. Don't give it up. Change the way, camouflage it, change the shape. Involve the child in making of the particular food if your child is not liking it. And this is how you make children develop a variety of tastes and variety of food uh, eating Correct. habits yeah. develop. Right? Actually, pressure does more damage you know, then good. So do not pressurize the yeah. child to consume a particular food if the child is not willing at that moment. Allow the child to choose what he or she wants to eat. That's most important. But I'll still take those two last mangoes. No, you won't. <laughs> Come on, yeah. I'm your friend, man. No, you won't. Will you run that extra mile after eating the mango? No, I'll sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. that's the difference. That's the difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, this question also comes to my head, you know, nowadays, kids are so much into technology, television, computers. Like my daughter plays a lot in the, the park and in our gardens, but I find that at times when she's eating, she needs to watch the iPad, even if it's about 15, 20 minutes. And otherwise she's free flowing. What happens? How do you ensure that your daughter is not glued on to the television or the computer? How do you handle that? So. You know, we have some rules at home, and mom is pretty much the one that enforces the rules. Dad bends them a little bit. Um, but we have, I think for me, a lot of it also stems from the way that I grew up. So obviously when we grew up, at first there was only Doordarshan. You know, then satellite television came in the early 90s. So then you had more to watch as you were a little bit older. Uh, but meal times for us were family times and we sat on the table and we ate our food together. And if we wanted to watch TV, it was finish your meal and then you can go back and watch television. So it's difficult in today's day and age, especially with working parents, because it gets so much easier to put an iPad or your phone or any kind of screen in front of your child. And then the child is at least, you know, entertained or occupied and then the food is kind of going in. 
But the problem for me is that if I wasn't feeding my daughter and it was my help who was feeding her, then the child has absolutely no interest or no awareness of what is going into her body. The food is just going in. There's no awareness of whether I'm full or not. So the child is being overfed most of the times. So the rules were very clear that there is no screen time on the table. It doesn't matter if we're out at a restaurant or we're back at home my child is not going to watch a screen. But that's an individual, and I don't judge anybody about it. That was just an individual and I, you know, decision. And I have seen many times that sometimes it is, where you have a lot of children, and like I said, all children are different from each other. So you have a lot of children who it makes sense at least to get their attention, to sit there for that amount of time if they have something that they're watching, which is fine. But limiting that amount of screen time also, so Saira is allowed to watch half an hour of whatever screen time she wants. It could either be the iPad or the television or combined, but it's half an hour a day, and that's it. And she's pretty good with keeping to that. Well, or watching dad win on the big screen as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You can watch half an hour of daddy's match <laughs> and then go to bed. No. What if it's, it's a crucial <laughs> match going on and you say, no, <laughs> she's not there yet where she understands that it's a, that crucial kind of a point or not. So half an hour of watching dad's match right now, in any case for her, is a really big deal. <laughs> so that's about it. Okay, my last question.